joining us during on the Gather Around Justice series. Uh, really excited about the topic today. We're going to be talking about, as you know, uh, criminal justice and some of the ways that we can improve or reform our criminal justice system uh, across the United States. Uh, for, those, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joshua Gunn. I am the president and CEO of the Peoria Area Chamber of Commerce and CEO Council. Uh, we are proud partners of the big table. And uh, as a new person to Peoria, it's one of the things that I'm most excited about uh, supporting and participating in. Uh, I wanted to uh, set the tone today for our conversation. I recognize that uh, topics like these, while they are very important, can also be uh, sometimes difficult, sometimes uh, emotional conversations. Uh, some people come to this from various perspectives when we start to talk about uh, the criminal justice system and all the other systemic issues uh, in the United States. So I felt that, um, or I feel that in conversations like these, it's always important to set the tone with the facts. So centering the facts uh, so that we all have some foundation for what we're discussing today and the reality around how our criminal justice system is functioning, uh, who it is functioning for and who it is, it is functioning against, quite frankly. Um, so I think Audrey is going to help me with our slides today. So it would be a bit, a little bit unorthodox because I'll have to tell uh, Audrey to advance each slide. So bear with us a bit there. Um, so what I wanted to begin with is looking at uh, rates of incarceration in the United States and point out something that uh, may be surprising to some, maybe not uh, to others, but uh, the United States is the most incarcerated nation on the planet. We are not the largest nation on the planet by far, as you know, but we incarcerate more people per capita than any other nation on the planet. And this graph really, really demonstrates for us uh, where we rank. As you can see, we rank far higher than most developed nations. So we are, a, uh, we are the most imprisoned nation in the, in the, in the world. On the, in, on the planet. Uh, Audrey, if you go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what that means for individuals in our, in our nation. And the second uh, challenge with being the most incarcerated nation on the planet is it's very expensive. Uh, but I wanted to also share this graphic because it hasn't always been this way. We haven't always been uh, the most incarcerated nation on the planet. Uh, and as you see, this graph shows us from 1985 to 2017, our spending on state prisons has ballooned, right? Exponentially from 85 to 2017. And uh, to be clear, this figure is in billions of dollars. So states in the United States are spending nearly $60 billion per year uh, on incarceration. Uh, next slide, Audrey. Here's another example of the fact that it hasn't always been this way, right? There was a time in this nation where we weren't uh, incarcerating a high rate of our citizens or our residents. Uh, this graph starts in 1925 and goes all the way to 2017. And as you see, it's a, a straight line up. But when you get into uh, after 1974, uh, for some reason, our prison population ballooned. We went from sort of a gradual increase to a drastic increase that's got us in what we would describe as the mass incarceration era that we exist in today. Uh, next slide, Audrey. So one of the things that I think we'll hopefully address today is the inequities in our prison system. So it would be easy to look at the previous data and say, well, we're just locking up a lot of Americans and that, depending upon your perspective, can be a bad thing. Uh, but the reality is our prison system is disproportionately impacting people of color. Uh, so much so uh, that the numbers are somewhat alarming uh, and black men are the most incarcerated population in the United States. So this graph breaks down the racial inequities in our prison system. Uh, if you're a man, you have a one in nine chance of being imprisoned at some point in your life. Uh, and this is for people born in 2001. So, uh, you know, sort of that Gen Z population, our current, uh, you know, our new voting demographic. Uh, if you're a white man in the United States of America, you have a one in 17 chance of being in prison at some point in your life. But if you're a black man, you have a one in three chance of being in prison at some point in your life. Uh, that is obviously a striking 
uh, difference uh, and points to some real systemic inequities. Uh, similar systemic inequities exist for Latino men who have a one in six chance of being in prison at some point in your life. Uh, when we look at women, all women in the United States have a one in 56 chance of being in prison. But white women have a one in 111 chance of being in prison at some point in your life. As compared to black women, one in 18, or Latina women, one in 45. So it's easy to see that we have some serious systemic racial inequities. Uh, it's similar across most systems in the United States, but most striking uh, when we look at our criminal justice system. Uh, next slide, please, Audrey. So I just laid a lot of heavy data on you, and I know we're gonna get into a really uh, productive, uh, intense conversation today about what's next, but just wanted to share a few thoughts. You know, there was a lot of problems uh, in those graphs, in those, in those infographics that you saw. And some of you may be asking yourselves, okay, we know that there's a problem, but what can we do about it? Some have maybe even accepted that it will always be this way. Uh, so I have uh, a few points uh, suggestions of areas that we can focus on uh, to make our criminal justice system more just. Uh, the first would be eliminating mandatory minimum sentences and cutting back on excessively lengthy sentences. For example, by imposing a 20-year maximum on prison terms. Uh, not only do we uh, lock up more of our residents in the United States of America than any other nation, we also uh, lock them up for the longest period of time of any developed nation on the planet as well. So addressing the minimum sentences is one thing that we can do. Shifting resources to community-based prevention and treatment for substance abuse. A lot of our prison population is either suffering from, from mental health disorders, uh, it, conditions of poverty or substance abuse are contributing to the majority of our prison population. So if we are able to shift resources to some community-based pr community prevention and treatment methods, perhaps we can prevent people from needing to engage with the criminal justice system in the first place. Investing in interventions that promote strong youth development and respond to delinquency in age-appropriate and evidence-based ways. This is really deferring our youth from away from our criminal justice system and offering them age-appropriate uh, interventions in their life uh, to keep them out of the system. Examining and addressing the policies and practices, conscious or not, that contribute to racial inequity at every stage of the justice system. Uh, I am of the belief that we cannot have any conversation about any systemic inequity in this nation without talking about race uh, and the criminal justice system is no different. You have to be honest about implicit bias and how it's manifesting itself into a, a disproportionate amount of people of color uh, being in, incarcerated in this nation. Last thing is removing barriers that make it harder for individuals with criminal records to return their lives around. Another challenge with a overly incarcerated population is uh, when people get out of prison for various reasons, reasons. they're more likely <laughs> return back. back. These are several ways that we can move forward and come up with solutions. Uh, and I look forward to hearing uh, from our panelists today as they, they begin to discuss things that we can do right in our own community uh, to address these systemic inequities and reform our criminal justice system to make sure that it actually works in a just fashion. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this incredible discussion that we'll undoubtedly have today. And Brent Baker will be our moderator from the uh, Greater Peoria Economic Development uh, Corporation. So without further ado, Brent, I'm going to pass the microphone to you and look forward to uh, participating in this conversation. Great. Thank you, Joshua, for uh, the introduction. And, and I'm pleased to be able to uh, moderate this session tonight. So as, as Joshua mentioned, my name is Brent Baker, and I am the current Director of Workforce Solutions at the Greater Peoria EDC. Um, so in my experience, I've worked here at the EDC for five years, but before that I actually worked as a, a Pure, an AmeriCorps member, the Peoria Housing Authority, and actually served uh, Taft and Harrison Homes in a sort of employment specialist role uh, and worked alongside a lot of folks who uh, had barriers that, that Joshua mentioned, who had disproportionately impact by some of these policies and practices in our communities, that pose real systemic barriers. In my time here at the EDC, I've also been focused on uh, building better career pathways at K-12 institutions here uh, in our region and trying to help this prevention effort uh, and, and getting kids and youth on the right foot, as well as helping employers find talent and, and develop workforce here. So. Uh, what we're going to be talking about this evening is, as Joshua laid out, are these real implications that are drawn along racial lines, that are drawn along economic lines, uh, and how we can reduce barriers to those in our community uh, to be successful. But 
for the discussion tonight uh, specifically, we have a, a couple of expectations here for, for everybody and kind of guiding light. Um, the first is that we'll be discussing some of those sensitive topics that, that Joshua mentioned uh, and respecting everybody's place on this continuum and this journey uh, towards justice. And then we'll also be discussing it at some points getting into aspects of crime uh, that might include uh, aspects of violent crime and implications. So uh, for those individuals who, who've experienced uh, aspects of that or, or some trauma, just please be advised now. Uh, nothing too graphic, but we just wanna provide a, a warning for everybody. And then also in your questions or comments, uh, please refrain from using personal identifiers. So uh, this, this um, topic can be very uh, individual and very personal if it has affected your family. Uh, but we can answer questions to scenarios without compromising the privacy of others. So please uh, mind that. And lastly, as you have questions or thoughts, uh, you are welcome to post them in the chat box at any time, or you can send them privately to Shernika Cagle on the participant list. Uh, and we'll be moderating those questions and selecting the most common ones. We'll try to get to, to those as, as time allows. We thank you for our understanding uh, for that. So next slide, if you would, Audrey. So as we look, before we kick it over to our panelists, as we look to frame up um, kind of a, a framework and a context for some of the discussion we'll be having, uh, really coming at this at kind of three levels, right? So what are the implications, but beyond the implications, what are the, what are the opportunities for action in our community around these three buckets, right? What are the strategies for prevention? How do we intervene early and keep individuals from entering the criminal justice system? Right? And then there's a second stage where individuals who might be involved with the criminal justice system, uh, whatever that might mean along the continuum, what are the tactics to reduce the harm uh, inflicted on individuals, families, and our community? Uh, and how can we implement those locally and support those? And then restoration, right? How do we actively work towards strategies and tactics to healing our community and the individuals and families in it that have been impacted disproportionately by inequities uh, in our community? So with that, uh, I ask you to think through those three buckets, right? So whoever you are in this conversation, listening and participating this evening, we all have our own spheres of influence, right? We all have our own uh, professional um, kind of circles of power and our responsibilities. What can you do within your sphere of influence and with, with your power? What can you do within those three buckets? And what are those strategies that we're gonna outline and talk about tonight that you could support or see yourself supporting? So use that framework as a way, as a lens to kind of view the conversation tonight. So uh, with that, I'm thrilled to be hosting, but uh, I'm only hosting and I am not uh, the actual experts here. So I'm, we're fortunately uh, have a, a panel of experts, so I will ask them to introduce themselves. So if you could pull yourselves off mute and we're gonna start with uh, Mr. Chris McCall. So if you would give us a very brief description about uh, who you are and who you're representing, uh, we can get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris McCall. I'm an attorney in Peoria. I've been practicing for 17 years. I am a born and raised here in Peoria, and I attended Richwoods High School and the University of Illinois for undergraduate in law. I am the owner of McCall Offices, and we, fact, and we practice mainly in family law and criminal defense. I'm active in the community as well. I've been a board member and board chair for Central Illinois Friends of People with AIDS. Uh, Peoria Police Athletic League, and I am the advisor for the local Cap Alpha Psi chapter as well. So thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Johannes, you are up. Give us uh, a little bit about you. Uh, hi, my name is Johannes Maliza. I am an assistant federal public defender uh, in the Central District of Illinois, which means I represent indigent people charged with federal crimes in Peoria, Springfield, Urbana, and very infrequently, Rock Island. Mm -hmm. I've been, I'm from Chicago. Uh, I've been in Springfield uh, and, and the Central District here uh, since 2017. Uh, I've been practicing about 10 years uh, and I'm very happy to be here with everyone and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. And Nia, um, introduce us to Nia. Hi, my name is Nia. <laughs> Um, I am a mitigation specialist in the Central District of Illinois. I work with Johannes. Um, I'm also a social worker. I've been a social worker for six years. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, but I've lived in Peoria for about three years too. Um, and I am also the assistant secretary for the NAACP. Excellent. Thank you for being here. And Mr. Holloway, Carl, would you uh, give us a brief introduction? 
Yes, I'm uh, Carl Holloway. Can you guys hear me well? Uh, it's a little choppy, but we can we can hear you. Okay, Carl Holloway, Executive Director of Mayak Community Outreach, uh, also a, a member of the Fair Employment Commission. Uh, what we do at the Make Mayak Community Outreach, we work with youth and adults uh, on prevention, intervention, job readiness, uh, pre-release and post-release, and focusing in on uh, single parent coaching and also connecting fathers with sons. Excellent, thank you. Okay. All right, so first question to kick us off. I think uh, one of the, the challenges is that the criminal justice system is just that, a very large system. Uh, and we have kind of a, a smattering of folks that work within the system and then outside the system. So. Uh, the first couple of questions will be around what are your specific roles uh, within the criminal justice system and where you serve. So we'll start with, uh, with Chris. So Chris, if you can give us a, a very kind of brief overview of uh, the purpose of the State Defender's Office, and then in your experience, where have you seen the systematic barriers uh, within sort of the, the state public defender's sphere? Well, I've been a defense attorney for 15 years, and I've worked hand in hand with the um, with the public when it comes to being a, uh, an assistant public defender with the uh, federal go government, a conflict uh, defender in certain situations. And of course, I've been a former prosecutor. So one of the first problems with the system is making sure that the, that the budgets are equal. <clears throat> what I mean by that, it's in many situations, the state has more money to prosecute crimes and to do their investigations and that essentially, it, it just exceeds the budget that the defense has. And so whether or not that is a full-time investigator, that could be a major problem. For example, the state, they may have a full-time investigator that can go out and look for victims, look for witnesses. More often than not, the public defender does not have that option. Additionally, when you're dealing with individuals who are indigent, the public defender will have to reach them in order to correspond with them about their cases. And that could be an inherent problem in and of itself, because if you're dealing with someone who's indigent, they may not have the same phone number that they had three to six months earlier. And so that makes it very difficult to, to have correspondence with them and talk about the case to prepare an adequate defense. Um, and I think the biggest problem is the budget, because that leads to sometimes a lack of trust because more often than not, the public defenders, they are very qualified, they're strong attorneys, and they're great at their jobs, but they don't have the same budget, they don't have the same access to resources, and so that can lead to a breakdown in trust, because an individual may say, well, I have this public defender, and, and I'm not sure if he's work, really working for me. Well, they, they're working for you, they're fighting for you, they want to do the best job they possibly can for you, but they don't have the same access to resources. Okay. So, uh, and just for, for everybody on the, uh, the call here and, and for myself personally, when you say indigent, what is the definition of that? Because you've heard it a couple of times now, and I just want to make sure that's clear for everyone. Someone that is at or below the federal poverty level. Okay. So if you were to kind of uh, wrap that up, just hearing you, is that kind of the, the <clears throat> inequity in funding streams for being able to defend versus prosecute, correct? Correct. Okay. All right, Johannes, what is, so understanding this sort of the, the state level and working at the state level, what is the difference or, or any discrete differences between the state level that maybe where Chris operates and then the federal level where you spend a lot of your time at? Um, so the federal system is very rarely a person's first stop in the criminal justice system. Um, the, the kind of original, maybe 40, 50 years ago, not the original, but 40 or 50 years ago, Federal court, especially federal criminal court, was for two types of people. One, the people who were kind of really big fish, who might be able to, frankly, outspend and, and outresource the state governments, state prosecutors, um, but also for the sort of people who are operating across state lines, committing the sorts of crimes that federal law enforcement was not equipped to handle. Um, think wire fraud, think some sort of international crime. Um, about 40 years ago, kind of right in line with the chart that we saw at the beginning, um, that shifted. Now federal court is really just a bigger hammer. Um, almost everything 
that is a, a state crime is also going to be a federal crime. Um, not everything, but almost everything. And most of the people we see in our court, um, about 80% of them end up getting appointed counsel from the federal defender, uh, meaning they can't afford their own attorney. Um, and most of those people have committed relatively um, normal crimes, I should say, uh, and essentially law enforcement or the federal prosecutor or just the political winds of the day say, all right, they're not going to be facing two, four, six, eight years anymore. Um, we want to hit them with a 15 year minimum, or we want to judge the chance to send them away for 50 years. Um, and those aren't exaggerated numbers at all. So uh, what they've done in the last 30 or 40 years is they started to prosecute a lot of drug crimes, uh, not drug crimes by people like Pablo Escobar or El Chapo Guzman, uh, drug crimes by people who have a handful of drugs two or three times and a couple of pre previous convictions. Um, they prosecute frauds. Um, sometimes they're big time frauds, sometimes they're smaller frauds. Um, a lot of inter internet stuff, internet based stuff, um, and immigration cases. Uh, so the federal system is, is really just a, a bigger hammer. Um, and it, as it's manifested over the last few decades, uh, it becomes a way to really get larger sentences and extract a heavier toll for stuff that has always been illegal at state level. Okay. I'm gonna, you, you mentioned a couple of things there, but I'm going to come back to them uh, in a couple uh, later questions. So thank you for, for that explanation. And Nia, um, explain to us a little bit more about your role as a mitigation specialist. So what does a typical day look like for you in, in the office? Uh, and then how many other mitigation specialists do you work with? Because it sounds like from the first two responses we've had is that there seems to be already a pretty glaring inequity around access to funding and resources on one side of of the law, right, of being able to defend and, and provide services to individuals. Um, so give us a, a kind of a, a ground level view of what a mitigation specialist does within the criminal justice system. So as a mitigation specialist, I support um, the attorneys and I support our clients during the sentencing process. Um, it really just looks like anything from me getting records, interviewing friends and family, um, doing research, uh, interviewing our clients over a long period of time um, to present their stories to the judges or the prosecutor um, and also probation. Um, a typical day for me, I, I feel like I spend a lot of time communicating with families because an, a, a, another role that I feel as kind of as a liaison between sometimes the attorney and the clients or sometimes the clients and their families. Um, and I provide a lot of emotional support, which is um, one of the best parts of my job, um, I would say, is just giving clients an opportunity to feel like they're being heard um, and feel like you know someone is putting in work and working as a team with an investigator and with um, their attorney to, to provide the best outcome for them. Um, I work with another mitigation specialist, her name is Katie. Um, she primarily works in the Springfield office and we split cases between our four, our four offices. Um, there, I will say that Illinois is not as progressive when it comes to um, mitigation specialists. Uh, I recently have been getting a lot of like pushback from uh, <laughs> prosecutors who will be like, you know, who is this person and like, what are like, what are their qualifications to say X, Y, and Z? Um, because it's not something that's done here often, even though I've been here now for three years. And typically when I'm involved in the case, I do provide a report. Um, but in places like New York, who have um, what's called community defender programs, they can seek funding from grants and pull funds together from uh, 
fundraising and other sources to have other mitigation specialists. I think in the Manhattan office, they have three mitigation specialists, a director of social work and mitigation, and they can um, typically have enough work for four interns. So what is so, your, so who are the primary individuals that you work with, right? Who are the people you serve primarily? And then what is that caseload? Is, is that the correct term, like between you and the other mitigation specialists? What does that look like? Um, so we typically serve people uh, accused of federal crimes. And, um, excuse me, our, our caseload really varies. I remember when I first started, I started in September of, of 2017, so July or September. Um, I, don't tell me why I don't, don't ask me why I don't know which month it is when there's a month between that. <laughs> but I didn't have any substantial work to do for about two months. Mm -hmm. And part of that was um, the attorneys in my office didn't have a mitigation specialist in their office. There was one before me but I believe she worked in another office. Um, so I spent a, a good month passing around flyers, like, here's what I can do. Here's how I can help you. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it, it really, but now we have, you know, we have COVID and so there are an influx of like compassionate release cases on top of our, you know, normal cases. So we can, and I think when I started, Katie had already been here for three months and she had almost 50 clients. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see 50 clients until maybe like my sixth or seventh month sure. here. So it, but then again, you know, every person we serve, whether it's just, you know, providing emotional support, getting records, um, talking to friends and family, uh, investigating the circumstances of like their childhood or adulthood with community members, um, it counts. So it, it really, it varies. Yeah, but it sounds like they're, you had to almost sell your position, right? So like, Johannes, do you have anything to add to that? So you had to go out and find your clients, it sounds like. If I could, if I could uh, just give Nia a little bit more credit than she gives herself. <laughs> um, she does two things in our office, which are massive. Uh, with regard to the, the courts, she takes our clients who are black and white, they're a record, their evidence and their charges, and she humanizes them to the court. So um, in federal court, 95% of cases plead without any sort of trial. So most people are gonna be getting sentenced. Yeah. And Nia tells their story beyond that one day or the couple days that they get charged. And she makes it very difficult for the judge to look at our clients as a monster and has to see this as a human. And she talks about how much their families and, and their backgrounds and everything. So she humanizes them. She humanizes our clients to the court. And that's hard. That's why she gets pushed back from the prosecutors because all of a sudden you're sentencing a human, not a <laughs> monster who's you know, yeah. committed some yeah, random you. crime. Uh, not to belabor it, she also humanizes the system to the clients. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, when you've got a public defender, they have 40 or 50, 60 cases sometimes. We don't have every time as much time to hold hands. Nia is the one who, who takes those calls and talks people through. Um, so she, she should get more credit than she gives herself. Thank well, you. Thank you for, <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for underscoring that. So, uh, I think Carl's having some some technical difficulties, so we might catch him up here at the end if he can uh, figure those out. So, Chris, I want to jump back to you and, sure. and something that Johannes mentioned. Um, so, uh, during our our last big table conversation, the first one, one of the things that Sheriff Asbell mentioned as a potential uh, lever for reform, or or one of these potentially low hanging fruits, is this plea bargain system, right? So it's problematic, and and like I said, Johannes just alluded to it in his statement, is that people plea out. So what is your experience with that? What is the problematic aspect of that plea bargain system? Uh, and then could you give a specific example of, of what that could look like? Sure, well, first what I'll do is I will explain what a plea bargain is. A plea bargain is essentially 
an agreement between the government and a defendant. That could be a cap. What I mean by cap is you could agree to no more than a certain amount of time. Okay, that's a cap. Or it could be a fully negotiated disposition. For example, let's say you have a DUI case and you agree to perform 200 public service hours and you will be on court supervision for two years and there are no surprises and everyone agrees that's what the agreement would be. Uh, one of the biggest problem with plea agreements is the leverage that the people have with the plea agreement. There are many situations where an individual may not want to take the risk of a trial uh, because a plea agreement may be safer. I have a case right now where I have a client who is, um, he denies he did a certain action and he's facing 30 years of, pr of prison if he takes it to trial and he loses the trial. One of the ways to make it more equitable, uh, to make plea agreements more equitable is to take away man mandatory minimum sentences, as Johannes was talking about, um, and, and also as Josh was talking about um, earlier. That would make it more equitable. It's very important that people realize that you have a constitutional right to a trial. Everyone understands you have a constitutional right to a trial, but not everyone understands the leverage the government has when you assert your constitutional right to a trial. So is there any, is there a position like Nia's position in the work that you do, uh, like a dedicated person to help, as Johannes put it, humanize the clients that you work with, or is that incumbent on you to actually have to go out and work with other organizations to, to do that work? As a private attorney, that is something, unfortunately, I have, I do myself because my clients don't have the assets to, to do that, um, to hire someone. So, so what I usually do is if it's a drug case, I'll instruct my client to get a job where they can sustain uh, reasonable employment. I'll tell them to get involved with drug classes. And if they have a history of volunteerism, then I'm going to ask them to turn that volunteerism in I'm, and I'm going to present all that information to the court and I'm going to present that information to the people. And that is the way you mitigate um, um, your, your responsibility in cases. So we don't necessarily have a go-to person like the federal government has with NIA and the state's office does not, the state public defender's office does not have that either. And so it is incumbent upon every private attorney to kind of do that for their client. Hmm. Okay, what, what about um, in the plea bargain system and, and some of these things you brought up is, what's the difference between defendants between or the plea bargains between violent and nonviolent crime? What are the, the largest discrepancies between those two? Well, everyone obviously has a right to remain safe in their own home and, and we all try to avoid um, um, having individuals that are violent participate in, 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 uh, in our American way of life. The judges and the prosecutors, they do hammer home violence. And so if you commit a violent offense, whether that be a sex assault case or that be a battery case, domestic battery, you are going to be held to a higher responsibility in the eyes of the court system. And, and frankly, that it's you know fair. Um, and when it comes to drug cases, usually the judges want you to get the help to prevent you from coming back because we all know that crime tends to spiral. Yeah. Um, very few people are just, you know, get out and they start doing heroin or, or another drug and, they, and rarely do they just start selling drugs to sell drugs. Usually that sort of activity, it spirals and becomes out of control. And I think one of the things that the courthouses throughout the country can do better at is nipping situations with heroin. You have some untreated trauma. You have some untreated abuse that needs to be dealt with because sometimes the individual, they take the drugs to take the pain away. Yeah. Very few individuals that I've represented personally that have a history of domestic violence, well, I should say this, a lot of individuals I've represented that have a history of domestic violence, they grew up watching domestic violence. It's just not something you wake up and, and start beating up your girlfriend, your husband, your wife. Usually that is a learned activity. So once we're able to deal better with the traumas and the histrionics for individuals, it'll make us all safer and help us to save money. Okay, thank you. And Carl, we're gonna uh, see if your connection's any better. So Carl, to do what uh, Chris was just getting at, the sort of um, 
and, and Johannes and Nia, they're working within the system with individuals who've already been indicted with a crime, right? So what, is, what was the mission and vision of May I Outreach uh, and how did it start and, and why did you start? What is the importance of it to, to do that work outside the criminal justice system? I think you're on mute, Carl. Okay, can you guys hear me? I can, but your your feed is still breaking up pretty bad. Jeez. Oh, yep, sorry I'm having some that. problems over here. No worries. Uh, we can uh, we can skip you and see if we can wrap back up at the end and, and catch you. Does that sound good? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So Johannes, uh, with uh, uh, what Chris was saying with the the difference between violent nonviolent crime and then the sort of history within the criminal justice system. So if you have an individual that has a history, um, what does that, what's the implication of the federal court system? So earlier said the federal court system operates as a larger hammer, right? But maybe they are starting to take on more cases or have started to take on more cases like drug cases. So what are the implications for individuals that have prior criminal history that fall underneath that larger hammer? So, um... In terms of the, the implications, um, two things. One, in the federal system, I wouldn't necessarily say that violent crime is gonna get punished that much more harshly than a nonviolent drug crime. In fact, I affirmatively would say that's not the case at all. Um, in the federal system, they choose what they're gonna prosecute and it is very frequent that they choose it based on how long is the sentence they're gonna be able to extract and based on what your prior records are. Now, those two are intricate, very intricately intertwined uh, in the federal system. So um, let's say you get caught with something north of personal use drugs in, in central Illinois, but it's, nothing like a kingpin. You're still going to be a poor person. You're not making thousands or tens of thousands of dollars monthly. Um, state cops might arrest you. County, Peoria County Sheriff might, might arrest you. Um, in order to get funding from the federal government, say they want to get a new car or something, they might take that case to the federal prosecutor. And they might say, hey, look, I've got this guy he has enough drugs for him to get a five-year mandatory minimum. Okay. The prosecutor will then look at that, look at your history. Do you have a prior drug conviction? If you do, if it was a felony, now you're looking at 10 years mandatory minimum. Um, up until 2018, that might have taken you all the way up to mandatory life. I, I met a 24-year-old I could remember he had spent a grand total of three weeks in prison or in jail, in county jail, um, on two prior marijuana felonies. Never hit someone, didn't have a gun, nothing, and now he's looking at mandatory life in prison. Um, and the way your interaction plays out is that your sentence in the federal system is going to go way, way up based on your priors. Uh, the thing that is important to remember is that that's why we care what's happening to 17, 18, 19 year old kids, 21 year olds who are more stupid than criminal. Because you can imagine a 21 year old who goes and robs a car. Now, if that 21 year old has a clean record in his, back, in his background, they might prosecute him, say, hey, look, we're going to give you two years court supervision. All right, you just got to plead out. It is very common for that to be pled down to a misdemeanor for a white kid and that to stay as a felony for a black kid. All right, now, 10 years down the line, let's say something goes wrong and that same kid all of a sudden gets caught with this handful of drugs. The difference between that, that plea back when he was 21 to a felony or a misdemeanor can be the difference between five and 10 or 10 and 15, 15, 25 years. We are talking about massive differences based on something that was frankly a non-issue a decade ago. 
And you just think about who's getting the benefit of the doubt. Who do the prosecutors, who do the police, who do the judges see as like, oh, this is just a dumb kid who's having some problems at home. He made some mistakes versus, man, this guy is about to be a problem. We need to stop him now. We need to get him in the system, get a record on him. And so your prior interactions with the criminal justice system really are going to affect what happens to you if you make a mistake down the line. And these long sentences are some of the things that drive mass incarceration because you'll have somebody who never was a serious criminal serving a 15 year, 20 year sentence because of some stuff they did messing around with their buddies when they were 19 years old. Yeah, so, I mean, it, to your, you mentioned there too that this thought, right, that criminal justice system, we, this person could become a problem, right? So we need to treat them as such, but that seems to be creating the problem, that mindset, right? That mindset of being able to, um, punishment over restoration and rehabilitation. Uh, Absolutely. But, but where does that, because this is, this is always the, the trouble with these conversations, right? Because you're, you're busy within the system defending individuals, right? So where does this change happen? Who, in, who instigates this change that, that needs to happen? I think we all have a responsibility as community members to be educated, but ultimately, where does that come from? How do we change that mindset to, to understand that the criminal justice system as we are operating it now could be part of the problem and how do we move it towards becoming part of the solution? Well, I think that, I think that we need to remember we do do criminal justice correctly in this country. It's just that it's not done correctly for people of all races. I had, a, I mean, and I can give two specific cases that are very parallel. 2018, I had a client, he robbed four banks, four, and um, threatened the life of the teller in each one of them. He was white. And he had gotten a series of misdemeanors between the ages of 15 or 16 and 25. And so when he got to me, he had a lot of convictions, a lot of misdemeanors, but his sentence ended up being 11, 12 years. On the other hand, I had a client who robbed a series of two banks. I think it's two banks and a CVS or something. This kid had committed almost the exact same priors, but they were charged as felonies. We know how, and, and my second client got a way worse sentence. And we know how to treat people. We know when to say, hey, look, you're 15, you're 16, you're 17, knock it off. We know when to be firm, but proportional when we want to be. And so the people who need to start thinking about this are the judges, are the prosecutors. Sometimes it's the police, don't overcharge someone. I guess that's a prosecutor really. Um, think about a plea agreement in the state system with a 21 year old who's getting into some mischief, robbing a car or you know, breaking into a car. Is that, does that need to be a felony on his record? Do we need to tar this guy for the rest of his life as a felon? Um, because it has more effects than just if they get back into trouble. As you said at the very beginning, um, or as Josh said at the very beginning, you know, you'll have trouble getting a job if you've got a felony on your record. You just are. You just are. Uh, yeah. Entire industries will be closed to you as a felon. Um, yep. and, and rental, credit, all these things come back to bite you. And we know how to treat people right. And when I say we, I mean prosecutors. And so listen to what prosecutors are saying about what they're going to be doing with petty crime, what they're going to be doing with young criminals whose minds, brains physiologically might not be done developing. Um, if people say, hey, we'll lock up a 21-year-old for the rest of his life. Well, why? Yeah. So Nia and, and Chris, I think, following up with what Johanna said, and I, Chris, I think, I think we have Carl who's trying to call in, so maybe that will be a, a better connection. But I know you work with Carl closely uh, outside of, of your day job. So um, if you could talk to some of the implications that Johannes just mentioned about the implications to the individual outside of the criminal justice system. So what are they barred from doing? What does their life look like based on some of these convictions? And Nia, you can jump in too, because I know you do a lot of this work with the individuals and their families. But this doesn't necessarily set them up for success, right? So how do we start undoing some of that work and being more just? If we do truly wanna to move towards a restorative justice approach, 
How do we do that locally, do you think? And how does that look like in your, your role as a defender in front of the court? And how does that look as you as a community member? Is Chris McCall like off, off clock, you know? Right. Well, one of the things I do off the clock is I mentor children. I've been doing that for 15 years, um, teaching them how to avoid the criminal justice system and, and teaching them to get prepared for interviews, how to tie ties, even if it's that simple. Um, I even have a program that starts this weekend where we teach kids how to, how to practice law, essentially, where it's a mock trial that's going to last for the entire fall. And, and one thing I want to do, I want to piggyback on something that Johanna said, and, and what he said was absolutely correct. But I even look at it in a more simplistic fa fashion. One of the things that the citizens can do and they should do, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here and, and all the citizens that are participating in the Zoom, is, is vote. It is very important to vote. One thing Johanna said is he said, look, the prosecutor and the attorney general, they're the ones that they kind of set the standard here for, for what's going to be prosecuted and how it's going to be prosecuted. The governor, you elect the governor, the governor appoints a commission to review the Illinois statutes. The Illinois statutes, at that point, uh, he can make a recommendation on whether or not uh, there needs to be a commission for certain statutes to be amended. State's attorney determines who is going to be charged and, and, and how they're going to proceed with charges. Uh, the coroner works for the state's attorney's office. You People elect the mayor. The mayor hires a chief of police. Uh, people like judges. The judges, they appoint uh, court administration, which works with juries. People have to realize the power they have in their vote. And voting in local and statewide elections, they affect you immensely. Thank you. Uh, and I think that's part of the, the challenge with, again, these conversations, that there's very little that we can do to start breaking down some of this in the short term, because these are, these are large systems that were built very complex uh, uh, on purpose, right? And so how do we right. build that, that coalition in our community? But I think, Mia, if you could jump in and maybe add some perspective, and then, and then we can give uh, Carl another shot. But what are the implications for those individuals upon exiting the criminal justice system and trying to get back into civilian life, whatever that might mean. But what are those challenges that, that interaction with the criminal justice system will impose on somebody afterwards? Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is just the stigma um, associated with being incarcerated and being institutionalized. Um, you know, like we've said several times, these people have hard times finding jobs. Um, they have a hard time reconnecting with friends and family. Housing is one of the biggest barriers that I've seen, um, especially recently with all of the compassionate releases, um, mm. just trying to find places that will allow people, felons, to to live there or I mean some of our clients have just an incredible amount of medical and mental health issues so finding a place that um, can cater to those needs um, that is also acceptable to probation because yeah. you know we sometimes we identify family members and friends who are willing to take the, their their friend in these returning community members in and we get pushed back no they can't stay there because this person you know was convicted of a felony 10 years ago like or i mean maybe not that much longer ago but typically anything anything that that they can find they will use to just say no like right now i have a client who bop has said that he has 18 months to live we and that was three months ago. Yeah. So we're having just a really hard time finding some place for, for him to stay because his sister who agreed to take him in lives in a trailer park. And when probation came to visit her, the same day that he called, her neighbors were smoking weed, which is you know now legal here. Yeah. So um, I think that's one of the biggest, the biggest issues. Um, and then, you know, just 
in the reentry process, less than 20% of correctional facilities provide discharge planning. Um, and you, you got to think like when these people are released, the, the access to health care is hard for people of color and black people in general. Imagine how much harder it is when you, you are just released from prison. Right. And um, to kind of piggyback on, on what Nia said, if you have a felony in your background, it's going to be harder for you to get certain financial aid monies, such as Pell Grants. That makes it a very difficult, and that's how yep. you end up in the cycle criminality. If uh, addition, if you have certain felony convictions, you may not be able to become a security guard. A security guard, you can't have certain jobs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we all have to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, it sounds like Carl. We have you on the phone. Can you hear us? And and can you uh, speak on the phone? Or are you muted on the phone as well? Oh, Carl, I think you're, I think you're dialed in and you're on mute on your phone. Is it star six? Is that on mute? Oh boy. Dang. Here we go. Hey. Here we go. All right, we got to mute your video now. All right, can you hear us, Carl? Can you hear, can you speak? Hello. All right. Hey. Can, can you guys hear me? No. Good. I think we still. I think uh, whatever you're calling on is having some trouble with the speaker. Maybe. It, 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 well, I apologize. Oh nope. There you go. You're We're good. good. Okay, we can hear you, Carl. So can you hear me now? You, whatever you're doing, don't stop doing it because we can hear you. Um, so we, you've, you've had plenty of time now, Carl, to prepare for my questions. So, sure. um, so, so give us, you've, you've listened to everybody speak about their experience within the criminal justice system as, as defenders and working with families. Uh, but, but this is something that you do um, outside of the, the system in particular, right? So you're working on maybe the bookends, you're working on prevention and restoration. So could you share with us a little bit about May I Outreach and one, how it got started, and then two, what is your, your ultimate goal? And then maybe you can fill in some of those blanks too about what are the implications of individuals who have a record trying to you know, uh, reintegrate into civilian life. Okay, thanks. First, first thanks, uh, this is Carl Holloway. First, thanks for the opportunity to, to be in this forum. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, great, great. Uh, can you guys see me? Does it matter? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, with, with working on the prevention, uh, what we're doing is uh, some of the youth and also with the adults, we're working on job readiness skills, uh, things that, that weren't in place prior to them um, committing the crime or being, being uh, charged with committing a crime. Uh, some of the things that I'm noticing, I'm gonna flip to the other end on the post release from volunteering at the state work release and volunteering at the JDC with the youth, what I'm noticing uh, by statistics, the first 12 months that these men and some women uh, uh, encounter when they get out, they 20% of them return because of lack of resources, lack of employment, uh, lack of transportation, uh, uh, homelessness, uh, things of that nature. Um, when they go apply for jobs and they say, okay, have you been incarcerated? They say, yes. Okay, and then they go into a thing about trying to explain uh, what they did in a nice way, depending on what the charge or crime was. Um, there's a barrier with, and, and I'm gonna just speak frank, there's a barrier with white felons and black felons. I know specifically I sent four uh, ex-offenders to an employee. I'm not gonna mention their name. We'll talk about that off the record. But, and two were black and two were white. Now there were two positions for entry level. That means no one needs to know the position that, but they're gonna train for them. They're gonna train them for the job. Well, they hired the two white males and not the two black males or not even one and didn't give a reason. Uh, when the men returned back to uh, the place or facility, uh, they were upset and frustrated. 
uh, we walked through that and were able to get them employed at another location. But what I'm saying is this, uh, at certain employers, uh, HR needs to also understand, how can I put this? They need some, some basic uh, implicit bias training, like what Mr. Akbar does. Uh, and knowing uh, that you have some sort of bias, it will be easier to treat it to me. Uh, the stages of frustration set in. Uh, according to the statistics, in 36 months, over 43% of the uh, ex-offenders that come home as adults, they return. And, and like I said, that being because of lack of resources and then returning to old behavior. But the first 12 months, which are the most crucial months, uh, they're trying to get employment and they become frustrated. And I'm not making up excuses, but I work with them on a regular. And those first 12 months are cute, crucial. They need resources. They need job readiness skills. They've been in the shoebox for five, six, seven to 10 years, some 20 years. So they have to be acclimated to a certain degree in order to jump back in the workforce. And if we don't have employers that are willing to take a chance and, and try to employ some of these individuals, then they're going to resort back to old behavior, unfortunately. So I think uh, this is interesting. So I think this concept, as we looked at those three buckets earlier, right? So we have prevention, mitigation, restoration what I'm hearing is like there's a couple, it seems like there's a couple strategies that if they're laid out horizontally, right, that cut across all of those, right? Housing, employment, right? Access to uh, even existing even existing benefit programs, right? Because in my experience, yeah. when I was serving at the housing authority, um, if you had a certain charge, you could not even access the, the public housing system, right? And get on a wait list. You could not sure. uh, uh, claim some other benefits. You could not, um, uh, find those those opportunities for employment, right? So uh, how do we start outside of just the criminal justice system? What are those strategies that cross cut those to be able to provide those baseline supports? And I know Carl, you've done a lot of that work and Nia's done a lot of that work. Um, but I think specifically for the employment piece, which we can, I think we, we plan on continuing to pull that thread in future conversations like this, but Chris and uh, Johannes, uh, could you speak towards what are the current mechanisms for uh, restorative justice that exist already, right? So I think the biggest two that, that have come up, and I've seen them come up in chats here already in some of the questions, like what are the differences between ceilings and expungements? And what do those currently uh, play in the criminal justice system in trying to achieve some sort of restoration? And where do they fall short? Okay, well, I kind of jumped a, jumped a gun. Johannes, do you want to go first or me? Ceiling and expungement is a thing unless you know President Trump. <laughs> All right. Uh, a ceiling is essentially when you can get your criminal record sealed. And um, an expungement is when you can get your record expunged. Essentially, there are some cases you can get your record expunged, usually with drug cases, or if uh, you weren't prosecuted, or if you were not, or if you were found not guilty. Ceilings, uh, there are cases, especially some class three and class four felonies, where you can get your record sealed. So to put it in layman's terms, an expungement goes away. Ceiling, something is there, but I can't see it. Okay. There is also another remedy called an executive clemency, where you can go to the governor and get your record, uh, get permission to get your record expunged. Where it falls short now it's there are a lot of drug cases where you can get your matter sealed or expunged. Um, but we all know now employers, they can Google your name and find out your arrest history. They can find out your civil history. A lot of people don't know this. You could be found not guilty of murder and your record can be expunged. However, if you are accused of committing an order protection, and that order of protection was denied by a judge, your record cannot be expunged. It is on, on your background, even if a judge found that it was inadequate, found it was frivolous. And that's something that we need to work on to change because 
if you have an order of protection in your background and you decide you want to be a security guard, you decide you want to be a police officer, you have to answer about that, even if, you know, if it was inadequate. Right. I truly believe that we shouldn't always be judged by our worst days and that sometimes your past is, is your past. And so I think that we need to explore more what can be sealed and what can be expunged. Um, as long as it's not a crime of violence, I believe that um, our government should look to allow people to have their records sealed and expunged more. We should increase the pot because uh, look at it from a tax standpoint. Why should citizens continue to have to bear the, 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 the brunt for individuals that are, leaving, that are living law-abiding lives because of something they did 10 years ago? It's not fair to the citizens and it's not fair to the defendant. The only time I disagree with that notion is if it is a crime of violence, but that's just my perspective. Yeah. So I think uh, we're, we're getting close on time here. We can shift to some of the comments that uh, folks have been submitting. So I, I do want to, it's kind of a final note in what you were saying there, Chris. Um, so like, where is that lever? Again, where is that point of action where you could actually uh, open up what can be sealed and expunged, the easiness of the process, so on and so forth? What, where does that change occur? You, you said, you know, the government, but you know, if it's kind of like the royal we, you know, we effectively are the <laughs> government. So like, uh, but where does that, in your opinion, in your experience, where does that change need to happen or, or even start? Well, the voting booth. That is where it starts. That is the end all be all. You have to elect individuals that have your interests at heart. Okay. That's simple. So there's a, there's one question from the, uh, the audience here that is, that's kind of lines with my wrap up question for you all. So we'll do a kind of a, a quick go around the table with this question because I think it's a, a good one to sort of underscore uh, some of the higher points here. So uh, the question is, given your involvement um, in the criminal justice system and knowing and experiencing and, and serving alongside the individuals that have um, been disproportionately affected, right, specifically on racial lines, what is one thing or what are one of those factors, if you had the personal power to fix it, what would that be? And so I want each of you to, to respond to that. So I think it's a, it's a large question, right? It's a challenging mm -hmm. question, but- Can you repeat it actually? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll do a better job at, uh, I can ramble. So um, given your experience, right? And the disproportionate uh, impact uh, of the criminal justice system and its outcomes, specifically on non-white populations, like if you had a magic wand, what's the one thing that you would change to start addressing that problem and righting those wrongs? <laughs> Go ahead, Johannes. Yeah, you're up. I, yeah. I never think this is a difficult question. Um, if I had a wand, I would readjust, at least in federal court, I would readjust prosecutors' priorities to focus on fraud by rich people. And here's why. If you're charging rich people with crimes, everyone's going to respect their rights. Right? Um, I, I was literally talking with, a, with an officer and a prosecutor the other day. And um, I said, you know, why is it that you arrest somebody and then just grab his phone and go through it? Right? That's a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment. But it never gets thought of that way because people say, yeah, well, it's a drug dealer. I don't care. Sorry, you don't get Fourth Amendment right to use your phone for drug dealing. What would happen if instead of prosecuting teenagers uh, for drugs and going through their cell phones, you stood on LaSalle Street in Chicago, started grabbing well-to-do bankers taking their briefcases, opening up their laptops, and going through just seeing if you can find anything. Oh, hey, look, this is tax fraud. You can't, you can't deduct that. Oh, look, this email, this is insider trading. All of a sudden, judges would be like, whoa, 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 you can't, you can't get into people's privacy. You can't start, um, you, can't, you can't just trample on people's rights. Maybe also, why are you just stopping people walking down the street randomly who aren't actually hurting anyone? If we, if we focused our attention on the sorts of crimes that middle-class Americans do, uh, the sorts of crimes that rich people do, all of a sudden our justice system 
would recognize how unfair it is, recognize how disproportionate things are, and recognize maybe that we've let the let the things go down a little too far along the track of um, locking people up for too long for crimes that don't hurt anybody physically, certainly. Um, I, I would just start prosecuting more rich people and re reorienting offices. And, and one last point, just a small statistic on that. Um, U.S. Attorney's Office in Springfield and the whole district, to my knowledge, only had one prosecutor who exclusively worked on fraud. Think of all the Medicare fraud. Think of all the tax fraud. Think of all the random fraud that we have in this state. Think of how few people that is focused on that. Everyone else, drugs, uh, you know, guns, which I get it's important, but we need to reorient enforcement towards the crimes that middle class people do um, and stop just using the most powerful government in the world to pick on poor people. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it, it's a difficult question for me because my mind kind of goes all over the place and I am more geared towards like, well, what can we do before they actually reach the criminal justice system? You know, like what programs could we have before they reach the criminal justice system? Um, I recently have been thinking about um, so many things that I've seen in different places that work and could work in places as small as Peoria. Like, for example, in Brooklyn, they have a program called Brownsville and Violence Out. And um, they basically just hire people, hire people that just came out of jail, hire people who are like from the streets, in the streets, to like be violent, be um, violence interrupters. Like they know what's going on best. They know the drama. They know the tea. Um, and they're the ones who can step in and kind of be like, okay, like, but what's going on here? Like, what's, what's really the issue and how can we address it? Instead of, you know, we have people who don't know what's really going on trying and are so far removed from mm -hmm. those areas and from those situations, um, trying to interrupt in something they don't know anything about, um, or just addressing housing issues. A lot of our clients have moved seven times by the time they may be like 14 or 13. Yeah. Um, why can't we have more housing programs to buy up all those empty vacant houses that are 10, 20, $30,000? And why don't people know about loans, home loans, like 203K loans that will help you um, finance your home and also finance renovations? It's like, there's so many things that we can do before someone actually gets to the criminal justice system. If we addressed all these things, then the people who say, well, we can't just say the criminal justice system is unfair. People have to take responsibility for their actions. Sorry, <laughs> suck it up. It. <laughs> then those people will have something to say. You know, then they'll have a, a, you know, a soapbox to stand on, mm -hmm. but to me. But I, I think that there are so many things we can do before um, we, we get there. Yeah, I agree. Chris, Carl, thoughts? I, I'll say this. I want to kind of piggyback on what Nia said. Um, I represent in, individuals, private citizens, police officers, judges, the full gamut. And one thing that they universally say outside of the judges is they're shocked about the criminal justice system until they get in it. And they're defending themselves and they say, whoa, this is different than what I thought. Most people don't have much of an interest about the criminal justice system until they're a defendant or they're a loved one, then they realize the inequity in it. Um, two words, public service. Um, I truly believe that the individuals that we put in office, uh, we should hold them to a certain standard where they are boots on the ground. What I mean by that is they should be in the neighborhoods of just not the people that are elected them, but the people that didn't elect them and mentor the kids and organize mentorship opportunities for them. I speak with a lot of citizens who tell me I want to help, but I don't know how. And that help can start with our leadership. 
uh, whether or not that's going into certain neighborhoods, and I don't want to name the neighborhoods be, uh, and, and risk giving them a black eye, but if our leaders can organize community service projects, mentorship, that can help begin to turn around our communities. So we won't have some of the things that we talked about, like Nia mentioned earlier, you won't have access to housing if you're a felon. Um, yep. what's, the, what's the, if you don't have access to housing because you're a felon, what's going to happen? If we're being honest and we know what's going to happen, you could be in a situation where you have an individual who is a convict and he's jumping around from house to house. And, and you know, um, that could be woman to woman and that could be child to child. And now that child could be growing up without a father and a child going, growing up without a father can lead to crime. But we all know the cycle criminality. So it starts at, I, I don't want to say it simply starts at home, that's cliche, but it also starts with leadership and leadership willing to be boots on the ground to fix this. Yeah, and then Carl, Mr. Boots on the Ground, because uh, I know you're, that's, uh, that's the life you're living. So if you had the ability to change one thing about the criminal justice system or change one thing to make lives easier for the individuals you serve, what would that be? Um, one thing that I would change if I could change anything at all and concerning the criminal justice system would be the systemic racism. If the level, if the playing field was level, if people of color and, and people, uh, not of color were, had the same fair due press process, right. As, as individuals, as you know, getting the same rights, I think under a fair system, I think, I think things would turn out better. Every time there's certain citizens going through the system, they come up with all these different alternatives uh, as to why this happened. Uh, well, they, 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 they grew up like this. So I'm saying that when it's a white male or a white female, now, when it comes to a person of color that grew up without a father, a mother worked two shifts, he was having problems in school, he had peer pressure, none of that matters right before sentencing. Then you, then you have a white male from Dunlap or uh, I'm just going to throw cities out there, Washington, Dunlap, somewhere like that. And he's got an attorney. Uh, he shows up in court with a nice suit on. His attorney says, hey, this kid just made a mistake. He's a great kid. He's had a couple issues with some some peer pressure. So uh, I know he hit that guy pretty hard, but let's give him probation. Now, the same sentence, I mean, the same charge, and then you have a young man uh, of color that's in court that has a public defender, had some issues in school, ran with a couple of the same bad, ran with a couple of bad guys, and he hit someone, uh, the, the same exact charge. Well, that kid's going to prison. So to end this thing, the whole thing in a nutshell, end this systemic racism, give everyone a fair opportunity to do process and, and allow people like Nia to come in with mitigating circumstances that will allow them to either get a lesser sentence or be shifted over to a rehabilitation center or a residential center or even probation and allow them to go through wraparound services down on the south end. Yeah. That's all I got. Thank you. Uh, so we're running short on time, but I think you know folks can, can jump off when they can. This will be recorded and shared out, but I do want to get to a couple other questions that people sent in so we can do this uh, you know, raise your hand or speak up uh, to this. So one one individual participant had a question here. So when does somebody lose the right to vote specifically? What is there a certain conviction or a certain level of conviction? Um, that was just a, a question from the audience. So I don't know if Johannes or Chris. Can that. Um, as I understand it, in Illinois, uh, everyone who when it's when you have a felony conviction, but it only lasts while you're in jail. When you get out you get your rights back. Um, there may be some sort of service issue. I don't know about that, but as a general matter, once you get out, you get your rights back to vote. Illinois is relatively progressive on that score. You can vote while you're in jail before you've been sentenced though, because I know Peoria County Jail has actually been very active in allowing inmates and people there to vote. Okay, uh, next question 
uh, from the audience here. So just a, they're asking for a discussion on the legalized marijuana in Illinois uh, and specifically the sort of need to expunge and release previously convicted uh, marijuana charges. So I don't know if anyone wants to, to speak to that or could speak to that, um, but there was an interest from somebody to kind of walk through what that process has looked like and has anything happened due to that, that legalization or decriminalization. Well, um, the governor, as, as we all know, that um, a lot of laws were passed this past January and state attorney's offices throughout the state are beginning the process of expunging um, for some of those records for certain levels of marijuana. You can also file the petitions, the petitions yourself um, and that way they can get done a little bit quicker, but, uh, but they are happening um, slower probably than what anyone wanted, but all the, the entire world changed about March 13th or so of 2020, but it is in the works. And where does that, where would an individual find that petition if they wanted to advocate on their, on their behalf? You can Google Illinois state forms and you can file a petition for expungement that way. You can also go down to the state's attorney, not the state's attorney's office, the circuit clerk's offices in various counties and, and ask for the forms that way. You can file them online, they'll give you a court date, and if there is no objection, then the record will be expunged without you even showing up. Okay. I will, I will yep. make one other uh, point to that. Um, it's not automatic. Um, if you had one gram of marijuana, which is not a ton of marijuana, like literally and figuratively, um, uh, the state's attorney can still oppose that expungement and um i was in front of a judge who is now retired actually i wasn't technically in front of her i heard a judge say um uh, well we still need to keep you having a record so that we know you're a criminal so it's not automatic some judges really want to keep keep people paying for marijuana all right i don't know how i don't know what to, how to follow that up frankly um uh so another question, kind of following up on a, <laughs> one of one of Nia's earlier points. Um, so these other models in other communities, right? So I think getting back to this concept that we have as a community, some local control, not only through, uh, you know, finding the the individuals for elected office, right, who who can help uh, expedite some of these reforms and changes, but we as a community changing our set of beliefs around what justice looks like, right? Just being able to understand what we value in the justice system to Mr. Carl's point as well about being able to respect and understand everybody's right for due process, right? And fair and equal treatment in the eyes of the law. Um, Nia mentioned a couple of different models for that kind of community-based restorative justice for lack of a better phrase. It's something that just made up, but what other models have you all seen? Um, that could offer promise or we could benchmark here in Peoria um, that, that would be promising and would help us move, move forward uh, towards a more just community here. Chris, Johannes, anything you've seen uh, in, you know, in the courtroom or uh, Nia, anything else or even Carl, what are those other models that we could look at uh, as aspirational for Peoria? I will defer to Carl, that is his expertise. Um, <laughs> well, okay, thank you, Chris. Um, <laughs> Real quickly, uh, I'm going to jump down to the youth. We actually have a, a alternative jail, alternative to jail program. Uh, myself and Mr. Bryson partnered on this, and we've been able over the last eight months been able to get uh, six young men uh, on home confinement and uh, supportive services and mentoring and coaching instead of going to state prison as a youth. I think uh, starting with those right now, uh, focusing in on <sighs> catching them before they go in, and then the ones that are coming out, deal with the post-release on that and get them into the services that they need. What I'm finding out is a lot of, a lot of men, period, are needing help with applications, resumes, uh, how to be comfortable with talking about uh, the, the time that they had to spend while being incarcerated, being comfortable with talking about what they had to go through and being able to explain that they've rehabilitated themselves, they've transitioned their life and that they're looking and they're seeking for a gainful employment. So those things alone, job readiness, uh, 
on post-release and then uh, have an alternative to jail. And just recently, uh, Governor Pritzker uh, announced their 21st century transformation juvenile justice model plan that they're working on in Illinois, uh, which they want to start having locally residential centers set up for youth instead of sending them to prison. To send a young man to prison for one year, it's $187,000. To resend a man, adult man, back to prison after he's been out is 151000 With numbers like that on recidivism, it's, we're going to be at about 13 or $14 billion over the next five years. So instead of spending the money on that, why not spend some money on creative community based options dealing with community based uh, organizations and then supportive services around the city. The other thing, employment. We have a special group that needs employment. Uh, ex offenders who don't, who are not able to get gainful employment, but are still seeking opportunities to get money will meet you at the ATM on Friday and take your check because they don't have one. So we need to be able to get ex offenders jobs so they don't result back to old behavior. That's all I have. Thank you. Mia, do you have something? I think this is an opportunity for community groups, especially ones that are recognized as like 501c3s or 501 organizations, any organizations who can, who can get grant money um, to apply for grants to create programs that would address these needs. Um, very recently, the NAACP was involved in the advisory committee for the Edwards grant. And I think Peoria received approximately like $8.3 million, some, something around there. Um, and we knew that it was important for us to advocate for the needs of our community members and returning community members. And so like we would ask questions like, will these training programs be, um, will felons or ex-comics be eligible for these programs? Will they be able to be hired with their program? Like things like that. Um, and so I think that it's up to us, the people that are not burdened by these barriers to step up and create these, these programs and these initiatives. Um, hey, uh, Nia. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Really? No, I was going to say to the audience, uh, May I Community Outreach, which is, uh, which, is, which is our outreach, we are a 501c3, and we are interested in partnering with other organizations that have the same mission, okay? We, we're interested in taking ordinary men and ordinary women and turning them into extraordinary citizens. That's our goal. Well, with that, everybody, I think we're, we're close to time. So uh, thank you to our panelists. Uh, it's, it's been incredibly enlightening and uh, educational for myself to uh, talk with you over the last couple of weeks preparing for this conversation. And, and I think a great, many great points of action coming from this. Um, and uh, personally, you know, I, I didn't disclose at the beginning, but I have uh, family, immediate family that has struggled with criminal uh, through the criminal justice system and has significant barriers. And that has been uh, a real burden on myself, uh, my family. And so these, these are real costs, right? These aren't intangible things we're talking about, but these have real impacts to families in our community and wherever we're at in our community, wherever you live, uh, if you're not directly affected, you, are, you still feel those, the, you, those costs, right? That toll still weighs on you. And I think, the biggest takeaway from this is that we as a community, the biggest action for us is being able to understand what justice needs to look like and set that vision for ourselves. That what does what a more just Peoria look like, right? Or a, a Peoria that treats everybody fairly under the eyes of the law, regardless of race, creed, sexual orientation. You know, what does that look like for us? Uh, and this is the beginning of that. And, and frankly, one of the more, more earnest times in our, the history that I've been here in Peoria, um, that, that portends to a future we, we will see that and achieve that. So thank you so much, everybody. I want to kick it back over to Joshua to hear some closing thoughts. Can I say uh, one more thing? Sure. sure. I'm sorry. No. I, I see a lot of elected officials on here. So I just wanted to 
take this opportunity to say to community members that are also on here, we are not helpless and we are not hopeless. Um, we have seen what people can do when they vote and when they voice, they make their voices heard. Um, I'm personally not okay with elected officials coming in and asking for endorsements when election time runs around and not knocking on doors, not making themselves available to their constituents. So I say that to say that you can make sure that you vote for the Congress that you want, you vote for the senators you want, you vote for the representatives that you want, and that will create the bills and laws that fit your interests and our community needs. And so that's all I wanted to say with that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, we've only got a couple minutes left, but I, I wanted to first uh, thank everyone for joining us and it's been particularly uh, our panelists, Chris, Carl, Nia, Johannes. Um, I, it took everything in my uh, power to remain in my seat and not uh, jump up and do a couple of praise dances and shout at <laughs> moments because, uh, I mean, y'all said so much. You, it, it, and, and I, uh, I just want to, I just want to tap like every time y'all were speaking. Each one of y'all said some really profound things. Uh, this this conversation is ongoing and super important, and I'm proud as the new president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce and the CEO Council to support this work. Uh, I want to affirm our organization's commitment to this work. Um, I think what we heard today was uh, we know that the system, there are several challenges in the system. Uh, I won't describe the system as broken because I think Johannes said it so perfectly. The system is working for who it was designed to work for. It just ain't working for all of us. And um, we identified so many reasons for that today. Uh, it was refreshing to also hear ways that we can help. Um, and, and I think the underlying theme was that we're all in this, whether we are uh, in the criminal justice system or not, whether we have family members that are, uh, it's impacting all of us on a daily basis. Uh, and we in the business community, the chamber and the CEO council have a role to play. Um, Carl, you called out uh, the employment opportunity aspect of it, which I support. Uh, there's a workforce development aspect as well. Uh, there's an economic development aspect, bringing jobs to our community so that people do have opportunities. Uh, many of the crimes that we talked about today are crimes of poverty, right? So we need to address poverty uh, specifically. Um, I think our, our criminal justice system, as we heard today, is a little bit too focused on punishment, right? There's a lack of investment in prevention, lack of investment in rehabilitation, uh, and we're overly punitive. And that the graphs that we saw at the beginning and everything that you all said today is evidence of that. Uh, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to start this conversation, but uh, for those that are on the call, this is just the beginning, right? And this is lifelong work. Those of you who are doing it, you know that you're not going to get easy wins. We're not going to address this in an hour and a half, and we probably won't address it in a year or two or five or ten. But if we continue to make incremental change, we can create the world that we, uh, a more equitable world and a world that's better for our future. So I'm, I'm truly grateful for your commitment to that work and just wanted to affirm uh, the Chamber of Commerce and CEO Council's commitment to being partners uh, with all of you in the work of making Peoria more equitable uh, in every aspect, including uh, our criminal justice system. So thanks everybody for joining. This was phenomenal. Thank y'all for uh, checking in with the big table. Look out for more updates from our team and uh, can't wait to continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.